A little boy was in a Sunday school play, but he forgot his lines. Now, his mother was up in the front row because they were afraid this might happen. And she was there to prompt her. So she began to make all these gestures and, and form the words silently uh, with her lips, but he it didn't seem to help. His mind was just a total blank. So finally, she leaned forward and she whispered the cue, I am the light of the world. The child beamed and with great feeling and a loud, clear voice then said, my mother is the light of the world. <laughs> I couldn't resist that cute story today, with today being Mother's Day. I think maybe all of us would probably declare with great feeling that our mothers are the light of the world. But I also like this story because I think it leads us into our scriptures for today. Now, it may seem a little strange to you that I'm going to be reading again a couple of the Easter morning passages. But that's just what I'm going to do. First of all, because it is still Easter season. It goes all the way to Pentecost. And secondly, I think that these scriptures are great ones for us to look at on Mother's Day. It's very, you know, Easter was late enough this year that we actually get a Mother's Day in the Easter season. So I jumped on that, and I think it's a great thing to look at because you see the women uh, played a very important role in the resurrection stories. And with us honoring not only our mothers, but all women here today, I think we might just have a few things that we can be reminded of from these texts. So I'm going to invite our attention to the first scripture lesson that comes from the Gospel of Mark. I'm going to be reading chapter 16, verses 1 through 7. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white robes sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go and tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. We'll come back to another scripture reading in just a moment, but let's look at this passage from Mark. The gospel writer Mark was always very brief. It's the shortest of all the gospels. He was always very brief and right to the point, and here is no different. He begins his account of the resurrection a little differently than all the other gospels, though. He begins his account by telling us that the Sabbath was over. Now, this is important because it signaled that all things that had ceased in observance of the Sabbath could now be resumed, including the burial rituals. You see, Jesus had died around 3 p.m. on Friday, and the Sabbath began at 6 p.m. on Friday. So the only thing they had had time to really do was simply lay him in the tomb. Here, though, Mark tells us that the Sabbath was over, and in the very same sentence, he also tells us that three women bought spices so that they could anoint his body and carry out all the proper burial rituals. Now, it's very interesting to me that Mark includes this little detail about the Sabbath ending and, and the women buying spices in a book where he, where he rarely includes many minute details. So I think it might be important. And I think... Through this detail, we see maybe our first lesson for today, for this special day when we honor our mothers and all the women of the church. And that lesson is that women often take care of all the little details of ministry to Jesus. Now, before I get into trouble, that's not to say that men don't care about details. You do. But I think that maybe God has gifted women, maybe they don't see it as a gift, but gifted women with an eye for all the little things that need to be done in order to carry out the proper rituals that go with the work and ministry of the church. And the example of these three women in this passage reminds us all that we must thank the women of our church who do just that. We see examples of this all over the place. 
flowers. I know they were placed there by a Sunday school class, but it was a woman who brought them here and not only brought this one, but changed it out from another one because she wanted to make sure it looked just right. You pick up your offering envelopes and put your money in them. Somebody, and I happen to know it's a woman, goes through here fairly often and straightens them all out from where they get turned all over the place. A little detail, but it makes it a lot easy, easier for us to grab them. The candle burning this morning, done by United Methodist Women. Our choir is led by Lynn. The acolytes oftentimes are directed and even redirected to come down the aisle uh, with the Bible and the, and the light. Um, and, and I could go on and on. I know last week when we set up for Jamie's Junction, we had a lot of guys there, which we greatly appreciated. They worked with all the tools and put everything together. But it was the women who put the little details on it, even to the point of how many chairs went in which line and what color of chairs went what, with what table and all that. You know, we, we women, I guess, have this eye for detail. And I think that that's an important thing that the mothers and women of our church do. And so we should thank them. But maybe we should also follow their example. Maybe we should all become a little more tuned into the tiny details of the work and ministry of the church. Now, some folks might think that small things don't matter that much. Others might say that maybe we focus too much on the small things. But when I, when I hear things like this, I'm reminded of a lady named Mary. And I think I told you about Mary not too long ago. Mary was the head of the altar guild at Swepsonville United Methodist Church for years. And in this position, she saw that every little detail was taken care of when it came to the paraments, the flowers, the Bible, and anything else that was placed on the altar each week for worship. And she made sure that everybody else who was to put anything on there knew and followed the proper rituals surrounding this ministry too. I remember when she died, my dad did her funeral, and during it he reminded us that Mary was a woman of great detail. And while many of us might not, might not have understood that, he thought it was a great tribute to her because, and this is what he said, he said, it showed how very much Mary wanted everything to be perfect for her Lord because he deserved nothing less. So caring for the details, no matter how tiny they are, are important in the life and the work of the church, not so much because we have to have them all in their proper places, but because it shows how much we love our Lord. Those women, you know, they could have left Jesus' body in the tomb, but they chose not to. They went out and they bought spices and they went to the tomb early so that they could anoint Jesus' body, but they did it because they loved him. And when we attend to the tiny details, when we carry out what may seem like mundane tasks to us to prepare this church and our people for worship and service, it must be because we love God and we want the very best for him and for his church. And this really leads us to the second lesson I think we can learn from the women that were the first at the tomb on that first Easter morning. This time I'm going to share with us from the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, chapter 28, I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 10. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. And there was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified, but he is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. And suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. All of this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, 
the women came to the tomb to take care of the details of Jesus' burial. But they were met there by an angel who tells them that Jesus was not there but was risen, just as he said he would. Now, at first, these women were afraid, and who wouldn't be? <laughs> but then Matthew tells us something important. He says, so the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy. It's another one of those small details that we might overlook in the excitement of the Easter morning celebration. These women were afraid yet filled with joy. I think that's because it suddenly hit them that everything that Jesus had told them had now come true. He had died, yes, but he was now risen from the dead. And that brought such great to their joy, to such great joy to their hearts that it overcame all their fear. And they had a lot to fear, not just the angels sitting there. It was a big risk for them just to come to the tomb that morning because, you see, the Jewish authorities were still out looking for all the followers of Jesus. And yet they came because of the details. But out of their faithfulness in ministering to and for Jesus came great joy, and that joy led them, when they finally did see Jesus, it led them to bow down in worship. And so the second lesson that we learn from these women is that our service turns to worship. When we faithfully serve God, when we do all that God has told us to do, even the tiny mundane things that need doing for the church, it not only comes out of our love for him, it also deepens our love for him. Faithful service turns into worship doing what we know is right and what we know is from God and for God will turn into worship as we carry it out. You know, sometimes I think we, we tend to wonder if any of the little things that we do are really doing any good. We wonder if anything good's going to come out of it. Maybe even sometimes we get kind of tired of it. Maybe sometimes we feel like we're just doing things ritualistically. Maybe even things like praying reading our Bible, coming to church. Maybe we wonder, are our hearts really in it? Maybe at times our hearts are not in it. But we must do them anyway because when we do, if we will be faithful in our service, if we will carry out the things that God has told us to do, then our hearts will be transformed and we will find great joy, joy that will lead to worship. When I was at Duke Divinity School, I was part of a small group that met each week to check on and pray for each other. They do that while we're in divinity school, then they turn us loose. <laughs> I think we need to do that when we're out in the field. Uh, one particular week, right in the thick of Advent, we were meeting, and I have to confess to you that um, most of our time was being spent grumbling, complaining about all that we had to do for our churches, because most of the people in this group were either an intern or a student pastor. And top that all off with, it was the end of the semester, and we had papers and exams and all that, so we were in a real grumbly mood. Time came for us to pray, and our leader called on one of our members. His name was Oliver. And I will never forget the beginning of Oliver's prayer. If, if for those of you that struggle to pray, listen to this. He said, Dear God, I don't feel much like praying right now, but because you tell me to, I will. Then he continued to pray. He prayed for all our concerns. He prayed for all our upcoming exams and papers and for all the busyness of the season. And then the funniest thing began to happen. The more he prayed, his voice changed. It changed from a low, grumbling, kind of negative voice, if that's possible. It got lighter. It became filled with more joy. And then something even funnier happened. The rest of us in that room suddenly got changed a little bit ourselves. The more he prayed, the more joy filled our hearts. And we left there that day ready to go out and worship God. You see, service had turned to worship just as it did for those women at the tomb on that first Easter morning. So when, when you feel like you're just doing things because it's the right thing to do, when, when you feel like the tiny details of ministry and church are just wearing you down, let me tell you, keep doing them because you're doing it for the Lord. 
And the good news of the Easter morning is that as you work for God, as you serve him, as you carry out all the work that he's called you to do, your service will turn to worship. But there's one final lesson, too. These women faithfully served Jesus by carrying out the tiniest details. As they did, their service turned to worship. But finally, we see that their worship turned to evangelism. As they worshiped Jesus, as they clung to him and fell down and worshiped him, Jesus said, go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Service to Jesus faithfully taking care of all the little details, led them to worship, and then joy-filled worship led them to evangelism. Now, the mere mention of the word evangelism seems to scare us to death. But think about what Jesus has told them to do. He did not tell them to go out and prepare a six-page sermon and preach it before 300 people. He did not tell them to go out and prepare a little pamphlet with all the you know, bullet points of what Christianity and following Jesus was. What did he do? All he told them to do was to go out and tell the disciples where they could find him. My friends, that, I believe, is the definition of evangelism. In fact, my favorite definition of evangelism is this. It's one beggar showing another beggar where to find bread. That's all we have to do, folks. That's all Jesus is asking us to do. Just show others where they can find Jesus. He will meet them there. He will take care of their needs. That's not up to us. So often we think we've got to spill out this long story. So often we think we've got to have all the right words. So often we think we're the ones responsible for converting the world, but we're not. The truth is that God is, and it's between that person and God, but they can't even begin to grapple with that if they've never met Jesus or if they don't know where to find him, and that is our job. We have met Jesus. We have encountered the risen Christ, and now our job is to go and tell others that he's alive and then point them to where they can find him so that they can meet him, so that he can convert them, so that they can then begin to worship their Lord and Savior. This table today is a great place to bring folks who've never met Jesus. It's a great place to bring them so that they can see for themselves all that Jesus has done for us. It's a great place to bring folks so that they can meet Jesus, who is present at this table. You know, I have heard from folks, and most often these are from folks who come to us from other denominations, who question, why do we Methodists allow just anyone to take communion? And the reason that question is asked is because there are some denominations who believe that you have to be baptized before you can take communion. But in the United Methodist Church, we believe, as Wesley did, that, this, that Holy Communion is a means of grace. That is, a place where folks can encounter the grace of Jesus Christ. Maybe even for the first time. So we don't dare prohibit anyone from coming to the table to meet Jesus. In fact, it's our job. It's our job. That's what Jesus said. Just show them, tell them where I will be. I'll take care of the rest. I think these are beautiful lessons that we continue to learn from these resurrection accounts. And today on this special day in which we honor the mothers of our lives and of our church, it's especially important to learn from the women who were the first to come to the tomb so early that morning. But just learning the lessons is not enough. We need to apply them to our lives. We need to be more conscious of the details needed for ministry and be willing to do our part to take care of them. We need to allow God to turn our faithful service with these details into worship. But even more importantly, we need to allow God to turn our worship into evangelism so that we can go show others where Jesus is. That's what we do every week. We come in here to worship, we depart to serve, 
And a big part of that serving is just telling people where they can find Jesus. Now, in closing this morning, I want to share one more Mother's Day story. It's a story about a four-year-old and a six-year-old who presented their mom with a beautiful house plant on Mother's Day. They had used their own money to buy it, and she was thrilled. But they didn't look too happy. And so the older one, who had a really sad look on his face, said, Mom, said, there was a bouquet that we wanted to give you at the flower shop. It was real pretty, but it was too expensive. It had a ribbon on it that, sa that said, rest in peace. <laughs> and we thought it would be just perfect since you were always asking for a little peace so that you can rest. <laughs> As we thank our mothers and all the women of the church, from those who were first at the tomb to all here today. Maybe the best rest that we can give them is to follow their example, to attend to the little details, to allow God to turn our service to worship and our worship to evangelism. For when we do, then many will come to this table and find the grace of God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.